Hello everybody, this is George N. Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And we're very blessed to have David Seeloff with us. David is the Director of Associates for Scriptural Knowledge, and he does carry on the work of Dr. Ernest L. Martin. You can visit the website at askelm, A-S-K-E-L-M, Dot com. There's a wealth of information there. Uh, they have books online that you can read, a lot of articles, uh, very, very good information. And you can also contact David Seeloff at this address. It is david at askelm.com. And Ask Elm, the E-L-M, stands for Ernest L. Martin. And today, David's going to talk to us about something very interesting. <laughs> it's called The Strange Story of the False Wailing Wall. Hi, David. Hi, George Ann. It's uh, always a pleasure and great to be back. Yeah. Uh, the story of the False Wailing Wall deals with a part of territory, a piece of territory within Jerusalem on the east side of the present city. And it's a, an enclosure called the Haram, es, Haram es Sharif, which is the, um, considered falsely to be the Temple Mount compound by the Jews. And the Haram es Sharif is the site of the golden domed, uh, um, oh, what do you call it? Um, <laughs> I can't think of it right now. And the Silver Dome Alaska Mosque. Okay. And um, this uh, this enclosure has a western wall, and a par portion of that western wall is called the Wailing Wall. Today, uh, that's what it's called. That's what it's called today. Okay. Because on the outside of the enclosure, down near the bottom, the Jews go there to pray. Yeah. If you put into Google. Uh, uh, Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, you will immediately go to uh, websites and pictures yeah. of this Wailing Wall area. The Wailing Wall is divided into two sections. About one-third or one-quarter of the section of the wall is used for Jewish women to pray to, or pray at the wall, pray to God at the wall, and the rest the majority of it is for just Jewish men. So there's a uh, separation between the men and the women praying bef at the wall. They are praying to God, they believe, toward the temple. And that the temple is then on, was supposedly on the other side of this wall, this wailing wall. Yeah. And this is the piece of land. And the... Uh, the golden dome is called the Dome of the Rock, and the golden and the silver domed Al-Aqsa Mosque is a mosque where prayers take place five times a day, and particularly on uh, extras on Friday. <coughs> and they have huge crowds of Muslims that attend, and large groups of Jews at Passover and the Jewish holidays go to the wailing go to the wailing wall and pray. And every time I go to Jerusalem, I 
enjoy, both for myself and those who I might happen to have with me, my wife or friends or whatever, uh, I try to stop a Jewish gentleman and ask him, what is the tradition of this Wailing Wall? Why is it important? And why are you doing this? And, you know, it takes a while. To, they're usually very busy. Uh, and I usually ask people as they're leaving. Uh, but there are some who feel so strongly about what they're doing that they're happy to have a Gentile like me ask them, uh, you know, why are you doing this? Why is this important? Uh, you know, what is the tradition? And what are the things that you do and the clothes you wear and that sort of thing? And it's a fascinating study. And they have different answers depending on who you ask and how much time they have. And, uh, you know, some are actually surprised, but some will stay and talk for five or ten minutes. And they believe that this is the only structure that is left is this part of this wall that has original Solomonic and Herodian stones on it. Now, it does have original stones, but they are actually the stones from Fortress Antonia. This entire enclosure of the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock is the remains of Fort Antonia. And the temple was actually a third of a mile south of the southern wall of the Haram al-Sharif. But the western wall is the Wailing Wall. And there is absolute proof, and we're getting into the article by Dr. Martin that he wrote on July 1st, 2000. So let's, let's start reading that. There is absolute proof that the present site of the Jewish Wailing Wall in Jerusalem is not any part of the temple that existed in the time of Herod and Jesus. In fact, that particular location that the, that the Jewish authorities have accepted represents the, way, the western wall of an early Roman fortress, finally built and enlarged by King Herod the Great. King Herod called it Fort Antonia, after the famous Mark Antony, who lived at the end of the first century before Christ. Now, Mark Antony was a an associate of Julius Caesar, and he lived during the early portion of King Herod's life before he was killed in the uh, committed suicide with Antony and Cleopatra. These are the same people. Antony was one of the great soldiers of the age, uh, equivalent to Julius Caesar. He was a chief officer of Julius Caesar. After Caesar died, Antony, <coughs> Antony went to Egypt collaborated with uh, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt and became a great friend of King Herod. And so King Herod named this fortress, Antonia, after Mark Antony. This fortress was formally called the Barris. And in the preceding hundred years before King Herod enlarged the fortress, it finally became known uh, as the Praetorium in the New Testament period. This was the central military edifice within Jerusalem where the commanding general of a legion of troops had his headquarters. And at the time of Christ, of course, this was Pontius Pilate. This rectangular type of building, actually it's a trip, um, trapezoid, all four, it's roughly a rectangle, but it's actually a trapezoid because all four sides are of different lengths. Uh, this building clearly resembles most permanent military camps that the Romans constructed throughout the empire to house their legions. The legions had two types of camps that they built. One, of course, was temporary camp that they built every night when they were on the march out of whatever construction uh, 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 stones or wood that they had available to them. Then they had permanent military camps, which were uh, high-walled uh, or wood in, in the northern uh, empire, wood or stone. Um, indeed, when the Bordeaux pilgrim visited Jerusalem in 333 A.D., 
he looked east from an area in front of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which was west of the uh, Haram al-Sharif. Then in, its in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in 333 was in its final stages of being built. He said that he saw this praetorium directly eastward with its walls, and he mentions walls in the plural, meaning the southern and the western walls, firmly entrenched in the bottom of the Ty Tyropian Valley. This central valley of Jerusalem, the Valley of the Cheesemakers, as it's called in scripture, separated the eastern mountain ridge of the city, which was originally called Mount Zion of the Bible, with the larger and more extensive western ridge where most of the older city is located today. Uh, what the Bordeaux Pilgrim provided in his writing is a perfect description of what we call the Haram as Sharif. It is the remains of Fort Antonia. The Herodian structure housed the 10th legion left by Titus after the Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 73 AD. The 10th legion concluded its presence within the, within the walls of the Haram for over 200 years until the legion left for a lot on the Red Sea in 289 A.D. The, now, think about this, George, and, and this is an insert by me. The 10th Legion had on their shields the boar head, a head of a boar, a head of a pig. So imagine all over Judea, everybody knew for over 200 years that legion resided in the area where Jesus uh, swept, or where Jesus uh, lived and taught. So that in Galilee, what did Jesus do? He cast out the swine out of a possessed man, oh. and what did the swine call themselves? Legion. We are legion. Yes. Oh my goodness. Now, this would have reverberated oh. for 200 years throughout everyone in Palestine, Jew and Gentile, would have known this story. And this, when Jesus did this, this was about 40 years before the 10th Legion came marching through that piece of land. Wow. Uh, now, whether that's prophetic or not, I don't know, but it, it would have had an impact. People would have remembered yes. that, especially the Christians. Now, that none of the Jews were allowed in the area of Jerusalem for a while, but they went up north, yeah. exactly in the area of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus taught these things, so that they would have looked at, heard that statement of Jesus in casting out the swine, casting out the demons into the swine, and the demon's name was Legion. They were cast into the swine, and the swine went into the sea. Yes. And then here come the the Romans with this particular legion, there were quite a number of legions, not just this one, but this was the one that stayed there yeah. for 200 years. <laughs> now, how did the present Wailing Wall, uh, oop, where am I going? Oh, here it is. How did the present Wailing Wall get erroneously selected by Jewish authorities as a holy place for the Jews? Well, as Dr. Martin has abundantly shown in his in his book, The Temples That Jerusalem Forgot, yeah. and his supplementary articles on the ASK website, the Jewish authorities in and around Jerusalem from 70 A.D. until 1077 A.D., over a thousand-year period, only showed their religious interest for the location of the temple at the area positioned over and around the Gihon Springs. And this was at least 1,000 feet south of what later became known as the Dome of the Rock. And this is the exact area that the Geniza documents of, from Egypt show that the Jewish authorities wished to live, to be near their temple, at the time of Omar, the second caliph of Islam, in 638 A.D., 
Omar allowed the Jews to return, and they wanted to live where the temple was. In the area, in the proximity of the temple, south and around the Gihon Springs. Yeah. Those Jewish records, the Geniza records were from Egypt, uh, discovered in Egypt and written in Egypt, and told about pilgrims who went to Jerusalem. The Jewish records show, as mentioned in Dr. Martin's book and the articles, that it is without doubt that the southeastern ridge of Jerusalem that contained that it was that ridge that contained the temples of Solomon, Zerubbabel, and the Temple of Herod. However, with the period of the Crusades, things began to change. After a period of 50 years, from 1099 to 1154 A.D., during which time no Jewish person was allowed within the city of Jerusalem, we then have records that a few Jews began to return to Jerusalem. Yes. And it was only at this time, around 1054 A.D., <clears throat> that some Jewish people started to imagine that the Christian and Muslim identification of the Dome of the Rock for the site of the former temples might have, signif might have significance. And this was first mentioned by a Jewish traveler by the name of Benjamin of Tudela. Uh, he traveled about 1169 A.D., and it was uh, he first suggested that the region of the Dome of the Rock should be considered as the site of the former temples. And this was a great error, but within a hundred years after Benjamin, all Jews in the world came to believe this very thing. And uh, Dr. Martin says, I will explain why they erroneously did so in a biblical and a historical way in another article called The Expansion and Portability of Zion. Oh, my goodness. Uh, in other words, yeah. Zion actually has different locations depending on different circumstances, huh. biblical and uh, secular. That makes sense. And so a new area for the site of the temple was selected by the Jews in the time of Benjamin of Tudela. Benjamin even pointed to a low balustrade that existed in his time near the western entrance to the octagonal edifice. This balustrade has since been destroyed, and he identified it. Today we would have called this a low, a low wall. When you see archaeological digs, you usually only see two or three levels of stones. They don't finish you know, because they don't know what the buildings look like. So just all you want is the outlines of the of the buildings. So that's kind of what it would look like, a balustrade that was there. Uh, he identified it with the western wall of the Holy of Holies that earlier Jews had mentioned in their former literature. He, of course, was mistaken. That The western wall that the Talmuds and the writers of the Midrashim referred to was that remnant wall that was at one time the western wall of the Holy of Holies from the ruins of a later temple than that of Herod. This later temple was twice attempted to be built, once in the time of Constantine from 313 to 325 AD, and again a short time later in the time of Julian the Apostate about 362 A.D. Uh, Julian was the nephew of Constantine. The, the particular site where those two later temples were attempted to be constructed was within the proper precincts of Herod's former temple. This later temple was built over and near the Gihon Spring on the southeast ridge, a thousand feet south of the Dome of the Rock. But in the time of Benjamin of Tadella, in 1169 A.D., some Jews decided to reposition the temple from that southeastern section of Jerusalem up to the Dome of the Rock. They also invented a second western wall as part of the supposed Holy of Holies by identifying it with that ruined balustrade at the western entrance to the Dome of the Rock. 
during this time in 1169 AD and for the next 380 years the Jewish people paid no attention whatever to the western wall of the Haram as Sharif which is now called the Wailing Wall until the 16th century of our era the western that western wall produced no interest in the minds of the Jewish authorities or laity and you know this is very interesting because the Muslims actually had no interest in the Haram as Sharif yeah. even after the Dome of the Rock was built and the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built it was just another mosque but it wasn't until later considerably later that suddenly it became of major religious importance oh. same with the uh, Wailing Wall you know it's yeah. it didn't have any importance until the 16th century indeed from the Crusades until the rise of the Ottoman Empire in 1517 AD the Jews customarily assembled in the very opposite direction at the eastern side of the Haram on the Mount of Olives or at the eastern wall itself that they now call the Gate of Mercy yeah. if the Jew Muslim authorities would allow them to get that close they congregated in the eastern part of the Haram uh, from the eastern part from the Haram in order to face the Dome of the Rock in the west which at that time they finally considered erroneously even the Jews accepted that that came to believe that that was the former spot of their temples when Benjamin of Tudela visited the spot in the middle of the 12th century he was able to stand at the eastern wall and pray toward the Dome of the Rock however of now in the 12th century the Jews still considered or even at that time the Jews considered the Dome of the Rock erroneously to be the site of the temple but they didn't until the 16th century start praying at the Wailing Wall on the other side of that enclosure. Oh. It's complex, but it's, uh, it makes sense when you understand it. So it's interesting that uh, a few years later, after Benjamin Tadella in the middle of the 12th century, the Jewish traveler Patakia of Radisbon mentioned the Gate of Mercy, but he said that no Jew is permitted to go there. Patakia said that the Jews were then meeting on the Mount of Olives and prayers were offered up from there. Yeah. This is in Elkan Adler's Jewish Travelers in the Middle Ages, page 90. This is further vindicated by Rabbi Jacob in 1238 to 44 AD who said, quote, we ascend the Mount of Olives until we reach a platform which is on the Mount of Olives where the red heifer was slain and we go uphill to the platform which faces the temple gate thence we see the temple mount and all the buildings upon it and we pray in the direction of the temple end quote this is also in Adler's Jewish Travelers in the Middle Ages page 117 further on in his writings Rabbi Jacob states, quote, Around the foundation stone, the Ishmaelite kings have built a very beautiful building for a house of prayer and erected on the top of, of it a very fine cupola or a dome. The building is the site of the Holy of Holies and the sanctuary, end quote. This is page 118. And though the Jewish records show that... Uh, Though the Jewish records show the, that Jews before the Crusades believed that the temple was over the Gihon Springs, now, in the 13th century, it was reckoned, erroneously, to be at the Dome of the Rock. So what happened? Well, uh, let me go on. Later, in the time of Isaac Cello, in 1334 A.D., he refers to the Western Wall that was mentioned by Benjamin of Tudela, which he said stood before the temple of Omar ibn al-Qatah. The language of Cielo is confusing because he 
strangely called Omar's Temple as being the Gate of Mercy, and that the Western Wall was located before the Temple, which normally means east of the building. Yeah. But since Cello is citing Benjamin of Tudela, who placed the Western Wall just in front of the entrance to the Dome of the Rock, there's no doubt that Cello also, what he t intended to convey. Yet Cello mixed up the chronology when he said his Western Wall was discovered at the time of Omar. When some Jews told him that there was some heaped rubbish and filth over the spot so that no one knew exactly where the ruins of the former temple stood. But an old Jewish man finally showed Omar, back in 38, 638 A.D., the ruins of the temple under a mound of defilements. The records are chronologically confusing because the later Jewish travelers misidentified a western wall as being that of two different time periods. The best period was that when the first period was that when the Muslims first conquered Jerusalem in 638 AD and the second period was that which began with Benjamin of Tudela in 1169 AD over 400 years later. Indeed, as I have explained in my book, Dr. Martin says, the first western wall was connected with the Holy of Holies of the sanctuaries built in the time of Constantine and Julian, while the second western wall, over 400 years later, was mistakenly thought to be at the western side of the Dome of the Rock. The Jews in the Crusades, in the Crusade period, finally accepted the Dome of the Rock as the general site of the Holy of Holies. Yet, there is, there is yet, however, a further complication in rationally trying to identify the Western Wall. This further confusion is, uh, is the selection by the Jews themselves of the present Wailing Wall as being the Western Wall mentioned by the early Talmudic Jews in their literature. The truth is, on the other hand, that the later Western Wall had nothing to do with the Holy of Holies, and everyone knew this. The Wailing Wall is actually the outer Western Wall of the Haram as Sharif, which Dr. Martin has shown in his book to be the Western Wall of the former Fort Antonia, and it has nothing to do with any of the former temples of the Jews. This later wall was finally selected by the Jews in about 570 A.D., and this is our modern Wailing Wall. But in order to semi-justify their selection, present-day Jews are prone to mix up the two earlier accounts and erroneously confuse them with events surrounding their present Wailing Wall, which is located just north of Robinson's Arch. Now, when, the, when was the present Wailing Wall selected by Jewish authorities? Well, let's look at the historical records to see what happened in and about the year 1520 A.D. and again in 1537 A.D. that caused the Jewish people to abruptly accept the wrong spot. Strangely, they abandoned their custom, customary practice of assembling officially on the eastern wall, at the eastern wall of the Gate of Mercy, or, primar or mainly on the Mount of Olives. The Jewish authorities decided to select the western wall of the Haram es Sharif, just north of what became known as Robinson's Arch, as their official site for assembly. It was an error of the first magnitude to transfer their devotions to this western wall of the Haram. Israeli scholars today understand that the present Western Wall has nothing to do with the former Western Wall of the Holy of Holies. Everybody who says that that enclosure is part of the uh, Temple Mount area, even those that erroneously believe that, none of them think that the Holy of Holies was up against that, that Western Wall of the Haram, not one of them. Now, um, 
Bang, it's lost my place here. Here we go. Now, this western wall of the Holy of Holies was thought to be previously located, remember, at first near the Gihon Spring, and then later, a thousand feet further north, at the west entrance of the Dome of the Rock. In his excellent book, The Western Wall, Mayor Ben Dove wants it to be clearly understood that the western wall of the Haram is not the same as the western wall mentioned in early Jewish literature that had once considered it to be part of the Holy of Holies. Notice how Ben Dov makes this abundantly clear in his book, The Western Wall. Uh, quote, <clears throat> page 27, There is a tradition <clears throat> that the temple's western wall remained standing after the Jewish-Roman War of 66 to 73 A.D. Mayor Ben Dov then continues, this is not a reference to the western wall of the Temple Mount, the present Wailing Wall of the Haram. All of its walls, all of those walls of the Haram, have survived to this day. The western wall about which it was prophesied, at least by Jews in the Talmudic period, that it would never be destroyed, is the western wall of the actual sanctuary. And in the course of time, it, the western wall of Herod's Temple, was raised to the ground completely, end quote. The western wall that later Jews were prophesying would not be destroyed was the western wall of the Holy of Holies of the Temple that was attempted to be built in the time of Constantine and Julian the Apostate in the 4th century A.D. As for the present Wailing Wall, it was finally selected by the Jewish history authorities only about 350 years ago. And that wall had nothing to do with the Holy of Holies. Indeed, no Jew in history before the 16th century thought that thought that, that outer wall of the Haram es Sharif had any holiness or importance to it at all. Something happened, however, that made the Jewish authorities accept the erroneous Wailing Wall site. What occurred was that the Jews eventually, uh, what made the Jews eventually pick this upstart wall that wasn't even part of the inner sanctuary, that former western wall were part of, is that something very mystical occurred in the history of Judaism in the early 16th century that caused the Jewish authorities and people to abandon the two other sites which they formerly accepted for the location of their temples, and they began to concentrate on their present wailing wall as the holiest spot in all Judaism. And that story is an interesting one. And Dr. Martin will now cite two Jewish sources that explain how the Jews finally accepted their new wailing wall. So, the site of the Wailing Wall was actually, at first, a Christian holy site. So let's, let's understand the historical reasons why the Jews finally and erroneously accepted their present Wailing Wall for their holiest place in Judaism. Uh, the Jewish records of the 16th and 17th centuries inform us that the place of the Wailing Wall was a spot situated at the base of the western wall of the Haram es Sharif where Christian women would assemble at various times in order to deposit their garbage, such as ordure, uh, menstrual clothes, and other uh, detritus. The first Jewish account of this practice refers to about the year 1520 A.D., it describes the place as having long been a dump of religious significance for Christian women. Oh, my goodness. Before 1520 A.D., no Jew or Muslim at all was inter was it were interested in the place. It had no significance to them. Wow. Because it was a Christian site that only Christians believed to be significant. It was a Christian dump of religious meaning to Christians alone. 
the pile of refuse at the spot was so huge, having accumulated for decades over the site by the deposits of the Christian women, that it finally became noticeable to the first Ottoman king who conquered Jerusalem. And that was Selim, the father of Suleiman the Magnificent. Since the garbage dump was near a region where Selim had his palace, he inquired uh, why the filthy area was there and who maintained it. The historical account of what happened is first given in a Jewish historical work recorded in approximately 1730 A.D., about 200 years after the event it claims to recount. The man who wrote it was Moses Hagiz, a then resident of Jerusalem. A full narrative is given in the excellent book mentioned above by Mayor Bendov, uh, Mordecai Naor, and Zev Aner for the Ministry of Defense Publishing House in 1983, titled The Western Wall, or Hakotel. <coughs> Hakotel. Uh, pages 109, 108 to 110. Now let's notice carefully the gist of the story. Uh, in fact, there were actually two stories that became entwined together within the decades that follow the first account. But it is easy to gather the main points to understand the central thread of their themes without any ambiguity. The first and chronologically the earliest for the actors of the story is that given by Moses Hagiz, mentioned above. He reports that it was Salim, the father of Suleiman the Magnificent, who was the feature actor. The second story, on the other hand, describes a time about 20 years later, and it has Suleiman himself as the central actor. The Jewish writer Eliezer Naman, Naman Poa, wrote this second story of the account sometime in the 17th century. It is the earlier of the two accounts from the point of view of relating the story to listeners and readers. Some features of the two stories remind us of allegorical personages mentioned in ancient accounts found in the Holy Scriptures. These stories no doubt evolved in order to make political points or to show lines of religious significance within the accounts. I will now copy in italics what the above book the Western Wall relates. <clears throat> One day he, the Sultan Salim, saw from his window an old Gentile woman, more than 90 years of age, bringing a sack or a box, a basket of garbage, and dropped it at the spot near his office. He became very angry and sent one of his slaves to bring the woman and her sack. <clears throat> when he came, he asked to which people she belonged. She told him that she was a Roman Christian, that she was a Roman, in other words, a Christian. He then asked her where she lived, and she answered, not far from here, about two days' walk in Bethlehem, and explained that that was why she was tired, because according to the custom, the Roman leadership imposed, everyone who lived in Jerusalem had to deposit garbage at that spot that had become the, the Western Wall at least once a day. Those who lived in the environs of the, of the city had to do it twice a week, and those who lived at least three days away had to do it at least once every 30 days, because that place was the house of Israel's God, in other words, the site of the temple. And when they were not able to destroy it completely, they decreed by a ban that the name of Israel should never again be mentioned concerning it. Therefore, said the old woman, do not be angry that I came with my, with a bag of garbage to your royal car, court. I meant no offense to you. The king, may he rest in paradise, listened to everything the woman had to say, and then told his slaves to detain her until he had investigated the matter to see if she spoke the truth. His slaves brought to him many others who, who brought sacks of garbage, and he interrogated them and found that they told the same story as the woman. He, the sultan, opened his store of silver and gold and took several bags of coins, as well as a basket and a hoe, which he slung over his back, 
and he issued a proclamation. All who love the king and want to give him satisfaction should watch and follow suit. He then went to the garbage heap and scattered a bag full of coins so that the poor should dig for them and out of their love for money, clear the garbage away. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> he, the sultan, stood over them and encouraged them. Every day he scattered more coins. For 30 days, more than 10,000 people cleared away garbage until he, had, he revealed the western wall and the foundations as they can be seen today by everyone. This ends the first quote from the book of Meyer Bendov titled The Western Wall. The above represents the first story. It gives the account, uh, the essence of the account that brings the Wailing Wall into focus. And it states that the <clears throat> narrative was chronologically based in the time of Selim, about 1520 A.D. I now want to continue with a further quote from the book, The Western Wall, about the second account. Quote, The hero of the second parallel story about the discovery of the western of the wall is the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, the son of Selim, referred to above. The author or source of this story is Eleazar Naham Poa from the 17th century, and he attaches the story to the verse, He raises up the needy from the earth, and he lifts up the poor from the garbage heap which is a quotation from Psalm 113, verse 7. Poa brings the story from an oral tradition and introduces it with the words, and this was told to me. In the days of King Sultan Suleiman, nobody knew the location of the temple. And Dr. Martin emphasizes this in the written portion. So he ordered a search of Jerusalem to find it. One day, the man in charge of the search, who had already given up hope of discovering, in other words, of discovering the new true site of the temple, saw a woman coming, and on her head was a basket full of garbage and filth. What's on your head, he asked. Garbage, she said. Where are you taking it? To such and such a place. Where are you from? Uh, from Bethlehem. And between Bethlehem and this place, there, is, there are no garbage dumps? We have a tradition that anyone who brings garbage and dumps it here is performing a meritorious deed. This must be, said the man. In other words, it must be the place of the temple. And the captain ordered many men to clear out the garbage from that spot. The garbage which, because of the great time that had passed, had turned into earth at the bottom. And so he uncovered the holy place He went and told the king, who rejoiced greatly, and ordered them to clear and sweep the place and wash the wall with rose water. This ends the second account recorded in the book The Wailing Wall. Then Mayor Bendorf, Bendorf continues with his commentary on the two accounts. Quote, We may assume that the tradition which ascribes the discovery to Suleiman is the more reliable of the two not only because of its source, Eleazar Nahampoa, who lived closer chronologically to the event, or because its strands are more true to folk, folk, religion, folk tradition, but also because Suleiman was famous for his preoccupation with excavation and building. It was he who, in 1538, completed the walls of Jerusalem, which are still standing today, in which you can actually walk around a good portion of the city, of the old city of Jerusalem. It would appear that, that, it, it would appear that theory line, in other words, the first account, was transferred by Moses Hagiz to the beginning of the Turkish occupation and to the earlier sultan in order to give it more importance. Thus, the Selim version was created later. The logic of such a transfer would be, if the new rulers decided to search Jerusalem for the unknown temple site, Dr. Martin says that, note that no one at this time knew the whereabouts of the former temples because it had been lost. Why would Selim not do it? 
in other words, cleanse the site of the Wailing Wall immediately on their arrival. Once the, in other words, once the Muslims conquered Jerusalem, they would have, you would thought, be able to go right to the temple site and say, well, this is the temple. Yeah. That's not how it transpired. Meyer Ben Dove continues, the stories cited above serve as examples of the general historical legends connected with the wall in the past. Another type of legend is connected with the sanctity of the wall in the present, a sanctity which is both general and particular. The general sanctity finds expression in the tales about miraculous cures affected by the wall, in stories about its desecration being punished, and similar motives which are common in folk literature in connection with other holy places and saints. When they happen at the wall, however, the miracles that happen are more intense. And thus ends uh, Meyer Bendo's commentary from his book, The Western Wall. Now, there is a significant observation to be made in regard to these Jewish accounts on, on why the Wailing Wall was selected. It is important to recognize that these records show that no, that at the beginning of the 16th century, a mere 380 years ago, no Jewish people were going to the western wall of the Haram as Sharif or calling it and calling it the western wall of the temple. Indeed, the Jewish historical narrative we have just been reading states that in the days of Suleiman in 1538 A.D., nobody knew the location of the temple. So he ordered a search of Jerusalem to locate it. Why was the first account dated to the rule of Selim, the first Turkish ruler to conquer Jerusalem? It was to justify the fact that no one knew precisely in the 16th century where the actual temple was located. True, all at this late date thought that the site of the former temple was somewhere in the area of the Haram as Sharif, but exactly where, no one knew. Was, it, isn't it interesting that even the scholars today are in the same plight of understanding? Yeah. They are also as, ig as ignorant as the historians and theologians were at the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Some think it was the temple was north of the Dome of the Rock. Some think it was on the Dome of the Rock site and others think it was south of the Dome of the Rock, near the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But there's further evidence uh, that the Jewish authorities did not accept the Wailing Wall until after 1520 A.D. Uh, they did not ex the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem did not at first accept the site of the, Jewish, of the Christian dump as having any Christian significance. It was only after the Muslims decided to clean up the area that some Jews became interested in the place of the later Wailing Wall. But soon after the Ottoman invasion of Jerusalem, certain miraculous events occurred which gave confidence to the people of Jerusalem that the Dome of the Rock was located near the former Holy of Holies of the Temple. Let's notice what happened. In the year 1517 A.D., when the Turks first entered Jerusalem under Selim, it was then believed that the area of the Dome of the Rock had the best credentials for being the place of the Holy of Holies. Zev Vilne, in his book The Legends of Jerusalem, relates, It is said that during the Feast of Tabernacles in 1519, it... In other words, the crescent at the top of the Dome of the Rock turned eastward. Its horns turned toward, turned to the east. The Arabs believed this to be a portentous omen. They attempted to turn it, in other words, to face it southward in the direction of Mecca, the holy city of the Muslims in Arabia. The crescent's normal position was toward the south with its horns pointing westward. And this is in page 30 of Vilnay's book. The Muslims interpreted this eastward positioning of the crescent to signal the coming of the Messiah. Jesus also taught that he would come back to earth 
from the east and to the Mount of Olives. After the restoration of the crescent on the dome, another similar event occurred three years later in 1522. Again, Vilnay states, quote, Rabbi Moses Spasola, who visited the Holy Land in 1522 in the time of the Turks, reported that the rumor concerning the crescent is that an overturned crescent was facing south. It was bent toward the south. Protrudes from a column of metal at the head of a dome, in other words, the Dome of the Rock, which the Arabs have in the temple. And this is, end quote, page 30 of Vilna. In other words, these supernatural events seemed to substantiate the thought that the dome was indeed the site of the temple. There were even more miraculous occurrences concerning the crescent atop the Dome of the Rock. Vilna reports another occurrence that happened a year later, in 1523, when a false prophet of the Jews named David Harabune, Rubeni, Rubeni, however, David Harabune, came to Jerusalem claiming to be the Messiah. Vilne continues, David Harabune, a false Messiah of Israel, went to Jerusalem from Arabia. He was on his way to Rome to petition the Pope for help in his endeavor to restore the Jewish people to their land. In 1523, he entered the Dome of the Rock, and this was forbidden normally to any Jew, but the so-called supernal events happening at this time, notably with the mysterious twisting of the crescent of the rock on the Dome of the Rock, caused even the Muslim Arabs <coughs> to admit David Ha-Rabune into the inner sanctuary of the Dome of the Rock. Bill Day continues with the story. <clears throat> now, on top of the dome, there was a crescent which faces east-westward, its horns normally pointed westward. On the first day of the Feast of Pentecost, this crescent was seen to face east. In other words, it had twisted a 180 degrees with its horns facing eastward. And when the Arabs saw this, they shouted in great alarm. I asked them, why do you shout? They answered, because of our sins, this crescent has turned toward the east, which is an evil omen to the Arabs. A woman, a workman climbing to the dome, a workman climbed to the dome and returned the crescent to its former position. But on the next day, it was facing the east. And the Arabs continued to shout as they vainly tried to turn the crescent. End quote. These supposed supernatural signs caused David Halrabeni to further proclaim his messiahship. He teamed up with a new, another Jew named Solomon Molko in Rome, and many Christians believed that some type of Jewish messiah was indeed in their midst. The two men, however, were judged for practicing witchcraft and both died ignominiously. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the prime reason I give, Dr. Martin says, the prime reason I give these historical accounts at this juncture is because at the beginning of the Ottoman rule, it was common knowledge both by Muslims and Jews that the former temple was then recognized as being near or at the Dome of the Rock. There is not one mention of the importance of the Wailing Wall that was located at the western wall of the Haram as Sharif in these early records. However, this was soon to change. A most eminent individual arriving on the historical scene who was to drastically alter the beliefs of the Jews almost to a man, woman, and child. And this was Rabbi Isaac Luria. With the advent of Isaac Luria, Rabbi Luria, around 1570 A.D., the Wailing Wall became at that time, a prominently fixed holy fixture among the Jews. This was because of the influence of Rabbi Luria. He was a most powerful Christian mystic and religious leader among the Jews. The historical records reveal that it was Rabbi Luria who selected the former Christian holy site at what became the Wailing Wall. What this all shows is that not is that not only Jews at this time 
did not know the precise area of the temple site. But they and the Muslim Turks were now relying on a Christian traditional site to locate it for them. And what tradition did they select? It was a very negative and hostile Christian tradition that was designed to antagonize the beliefs of Jews and Muslims. Oh my God. Still, the Jews and Muslims reasoned that if the Christians had a long time had for a long time cast garbage at the site where the Wailing Wall was finally selected, and the heap of garbage had grown so high that the bottom of the pile had turned into soil <clears throat> compost, then surely the Christians must be correct. This was Jewish and Muslim reasoning at the time. After all, the Jews and Muslim authorities readily admitted that no, no one of them knew the precise spot where the Holy of Holies had once been located. The actions of the Christians regarding the place of their religious dump impressed the Jews and the Muslims. There seemed to be historical precedents for this belief. Recall that it was that there was also an early Christian account that when Omar the uh, second caliph in 638 AD was seeking the spot of the Jewish temple that an old Jewish man showed the Sultan where the Holy of Holies had been. It was also a rubbish dump, but mentioned in the records some 900 years before the time of the Ottoman Turks. It was in other words, Omar, the second caliph, he was an Arab. The Turks came later. They came from the east, but they also converted to Islam. It was this earlier story that had been long circulated in the Middle East that no doubt led Selim or Suleiman and later Jewish authorities to think that this new rubbish dump that the Christians had man maintained was in some way connected with the original temple site. What astonishing, what is astonishing is the fact that the stories relate that it was the Christians who had initiated the dump and had perpetuated its use from olden days. You talk about a weak evidence trail, George, yes. and this yes. is ridiculous. <laughs> yes. Jews and Muslims in the preceding 350 years had paid no attention to the site whatever. It was other areas that Jews and Muslims were interested in. It must be remembered that Omar was shown in his day the temple site over and near the Gihon Spring, while the accounts of the Christian women some 900 years later in the 16th century had redeposited the temple site, I'm sorry, had repositioned the temple site to an area somewhere near their rubbish dump which was adjacent to the western wall of the Haram. So, the f first the Muslims and then the Jewish authorities in the middle and late 16th century began to think that perhaps the Jewish, perhaps the Christian identification at what became the Wailing Wall was indeed the correct site. What an anachronism. Here we have the Muslim authorities in the time of Suleiman the Magnificent relying on a Christian site that was established as a place of hate and revulsion to locate the Jewish house of God. Indeed, this garbage dump, according to the story, became a prime, a Muslim prime proof of where the once glorious temples were located. This must be the case because the accounts show that neither Selim nor Suleiman before the selection of the dump area, with all their historians and professional men, were able to discover the true site of the temple. The Ottoman Turks were oblivious to the real site. True, tradition placed the temple somewhere within the Haram as Sharif, but just where within that enclosure was the correct spot. What is interesting is the fact that there is still not a scholar today, whether Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, who can inform any person dogmatically where the Holy of Holies was, even at this start of the 21st century. All scholars and religious authorities are still in the dark regarding what they consider to be the exact spot for the temple within the area of the Haram. The fact is, however, 
they are all looking in the wrong place. The Haram as Sharif, as Dr. Martin has adequately proved, is the military camp of Fort Antonio. The actual temples of God were located a thousand feet farther south from the Dome of the Rock and 600 feet south of the southern wall of the Haram as Sharif. Now, why... How, how are we doing on time here? Sure, you're okay, Dave. Okay. This is an amazing story. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yeah, all these strange uh, visions, and it gets worse yeah, okay. when we get into Luria. Yeah. Why did the Jewish authorities finally select the Wailing Wall as a wall of Herod's temple? Well, the historical records show that the Jewish authorities did not at first follow the Muslims in this identification of this Christian garbage dump being near the temple. Or that it pointed toward it. The Jews had to rely on other factors to accept the area of the dump. Indeed, it is true that the Jewish authorities finally relented and began to pay attention to the Wailing Wall. This happened because of the experiences and teachings of a most respected rabbi that finally accepted the spot as holy. That rabbi was Isaac Luria, referred to as Ha'ari, or the Lion the creator of what became known as the Lurianic Kabbalah. Indeed, the Jews from the time of Benjamin Tudela in 1069 until the rise of the Ottoman Empire in 1517 AD showed not the slightest attention to this formerly Christian part of the, Christ, of the Western Wall as a place holy and sanctified to them. It was a Christian spot for many years and then it was cleansed, cleaned up by the Muslims to become a holy site to them. Eventually, the Jewish authorities felt that it was also proper for them to recognize it. By the way, did you notice that the Muslims actually were the first ones before the Jews to consider this to be a holy site? Oh, my goodness. Oh. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes. And, and if the Jews would be driven out of the holy the Wailing Wall area, I guarantee you the Muslims would probably use this evidence or, you know, discover it for themselves Yes. Uh, to suddenly proclaim that area holy also. Oh it's just amazing. Goodness. Yes, it is. This, is. this is one heck of a story. <laughs> oh. Up to the time of Rabbi Isaac Luria, who was born in Jerusalem in 1534 and died in 1572 A.D., the Jewish custom for almost the previous 400 years was to assemble at the Eastern Wall at the Gate of Mercy or on the Mount of Olives and pray westward toward the Dome of the Rock. <clears throat> now, why would they do that? <coughs> Excuse me. They would do that because the Old Testament says you are always a supposed to approach God from the East. Always, without exception in all your prayers. If you can get to the east of God's presence, you are supposed to do that. Uh, because you approach God. You don't approach a ruler's backside. Yeah. You approach him in yes. obeisance yes. from his face. Yes. And God faced east. It's, it's bizarre. They adored a balustrade that they thought was the western wall of the Holy of Holies. But J Rabbi Luria changed this. I will now show, Dr. Martin says, what prompted this action of acceptance. What the Jewish authorities did was to heed the words of Luria, and from then on they began to assemble, as they do now, at their new western wall, western wall, the Wailing Wall. So who was this Rabbi Isaac Luria? In the middle of the 16th century, practically the whole of the Jewish people went over to a belief in the philosophies of a man named Rabbi Jacob Luria. He was the person who established what we call the Lurianic Kabbalah, a form of mystic Gnosticism without the Christian gloss that led people into doctrines that were as for foreign to Moses, Isaiah, and Ezra as anyone could get. And this also includes the teachings of those Jews who wrote the Talmuds and other writings up to about the 13th century A.D. 
among other false doctrines that are counter to the simple teachings of the Holy Scriptures, Luria taught the Gentile doctrine of the immortality of the soul, and even more Gentile in origin, the doctrine of the transmigration of souls, very similar as the Hebrew, as the Hindus do today. Yeah. And major schools of Orthodox Judaism teach this today. Most, I've even heard that they all do. What, the transmigration of souls? Yes. All Orthodox uh, groups believe in transmigration of souls. Oh my goodness, I was not aware of that. Both these doctrines are diametrically contrary to the basic teachings of the Old Testament, right. the Tanakh, and also of the New Testament. And we've, Dr. Martin says he's written research papers showing the erroneous nature of the immortality of the soul yes. and the transmigration of the soul. Oh. Rabbi Luria promoted as a prime doctrine that it was normal for the people who lived in one generation to appear after their deaths as other persons in the next generation. Oh, my goodness. And this teaching did not require a resurrection from the dead as Scripture demands. Huh. I think that's the reason why. Because if you don't need a resurrection from the dead, then you don't need a Messiah yeah. who is resurrected from a real death. Goodness. In other words, Luria believed and taught reincarnation or metapsychosis. And the whole of the Jewish nation at the time went over to believing his strange and anti-biblical teaching while they continued to keep the Sabbath, food laws, and other external rituals that identified the people as still being Jews. And what year was this? <clears throat> Middle 1500s. Wow, yeah. Note what the Encyclopedia of Judah of Religion, Encyclopedia of Religion has to relate about the influence of Luria. Quote, Luria, Isaac, 1534 to 1572, known also by the acronym REI, that is Ha REI, Ha Elohi Rabbi Yitzik, the godly Rabbi Isaac, Jewish mystic. Isaac Luria was the preeminent Kabbalist of Safed, a small town in Galilee, where a remarkable renaissance of Jewish mystical life took place in the 16th century. Not only did Luria's original mythological system and innovative ritual practices achieve great popularity in Safed itself, they also exerted profound influence upon virtually all subsequent Jewish mystical creativity. By the middle of the 17th century, Lurianic theology and ritual practices had permeated much of the Jewish world. It has been observed that Lurianism it was the last pre-modern theological system to enjoy such widespread acceptance within Judaism. This is in Volume 9, pages 54 to 55 of Encyclopedia of Religion, under L, I would suppose. Luria even adopted some theological teachings similar to the Christian belief in the Trinity, that God is to be found in is to be found one God manifested in three persons. But Luria went even further. He used the same principle of interpretation of the early Christians, but he devised ten different manifestations of God that he called seraphiot, sephiriot. S-E-F-I-R-O-T, Sephirot, yes. that were supposed to represent one God. L Luria's top, foremost manifestation of his plural Godhead was a non-being, never known by Moses or the prophets or those sages of the Talmuds. Right. He finally, he called his final manifestation of the deity as Ein Sof, which in Hebrew means no end, or simply, the end is nothing, or nothing is the end. Which is another way of saying, in a philosophical sense, there is no definable God. Or, all that there is in the universe is nothing. Or that God is a God who is in exile or in hiding. This was another way of teaching that there is no God in the final analysis of things. Oh my goodness. 
in a word, it is a teaching advocating atheism. Yes. Luria, Luria also followed in the footsteps of Maimonides even further in his acceptance of the principles of Aristotle. For a century and a half, Luria had a profound influence on all sections of Jewish religious belief and society. Continuing with the comments in the Encyclopedia of Religion, we read, It appears that Luria possessed the traits of a genuinely inspired and charismatic individual. He became known as in, in Safed as an extraordinarily saintly person who had been privileged to experience personal revelations of Kabbalistic knowledge from the Holy Spirit, the prophet Elijah, and dead rabbis. Oh departed rabbis. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> he was regarded as having knowledge of such esoteric arts as me metoposcopy and physiognomy, um, physiognomy and the ability to understand the language of animals. In other words, he was like Dr. Doolittle. Yeah. He was able to diagnose the spiritual condition of his disciples and others and provide them with specific acts of atonement for restoring their souls to a state of purity. Oh my goodness, what a sham this guy is. <laughs> to his formal disciples who numbered about 35, Luria imparted esoteric wisdom, vouchsafing to each one mystical knowledge pertinent to his particular soul, such as his ancestry and the trans transmigrations through which he had gone. He, in other words, he read his past lives. He also gave his disciples detailed instructions on the meditative techniques by which they could raise their souls up to the divine realm, commune with the souls of departed rabbis, and achieve revelatory experiences of their own. End quote. This is in volume 9, uh, page 55. <clears throat> Rabbi Luria was born in Jerusalem in 50, 1534 A.D. In Jewish opinion, he was the most important he was a most important child in a prophetic point of view. It was believed that Elijah the prophet appeared to, to the father of Rabbi Luria and told him, quote, to keep this child well, for a great light shall shine forth from him to Israel and to the whole world, end quote. This is in Vilna, Legends of Jerusalem, page 199. Through much meditation that he learned in Egypt, he finally moved to Safed in Galilee and won over most of the Jewish Kabbalists who lived there. He was capable of pointing out at a distance the unmarked and unknown graves of past rabbis and holy men to precisely identify them. There was no way of proving Luria wrong in most instances because many of the graves he discovered had no markings on them and people had to assume that Luria because of his saintliness, had to be correct in his identifications. Saintliness. Oh, gee. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, um, oh. Visiting holy graves was considered particularly desirable by the Kabbalists in Safed. Jacob Luria, the foremost exponent of that school, is credited with having revealed hitherto unknown graves. End quote. Encyclopedia Judaica article Luria. Continuing the quote, the custom of visiting graves seems to be of old Arabic origin. Nearly all of the Jewish travelers who visited Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, mentioned graves in their accounts. And indeed, many travel books outlining itineraries and listing the graves enjoyed wide circulation. A pilgrim to a holy site was considered to have therapeutic value, a pilgrimage, to a holy site was considered to have therapeutic value and many customs developed for such visits. Candles were lit at the grave. Often the supplicants made ceremonial processions around the graves and prostrated themselves on it. There was and still is a widespread custom of placing a small stone or a pebble on the grave and some pilgrims take a stone from it when they leave. It is also common practice to leave a written petition at the grave. As early as the beginning of the 10th century, the Karaite scholar Saul ben Mazoya complained, How can I remain silent when some Jews are behaving like idolaters? 
They sit at the graves, sometimes sleeping there at night, and appeal to the dead. Oh, Rabbi Yose Hagelili, heal me, grant me children. They kindle lights there and offer incense, end quote. And this is from Pinsker, Ledutke, I don't know, some book. <laughs> it's, it's in the Judaic, Encyclopedia Judaica article, Jewish Holy Places. Wow. And true enough, this, this is outright paganism in the oh, yeah. <laughs> Big time paganism. <laughs> the Karaite Jewish scholar mentioned in the last quote was absolutely correct. People who do such things are practicing heathen and idolatrous customs and it is utterly condemned in the Holy Scriptures, well, according uh, to I yeah. Isaiah 8, verses 19 and 20. Yes, you, David, absolutely, and guess who's behind doing that, because the Jewish people uh, have this situation going with God, and, you know, Satan would just love <laughs> to... Uh, yeah, corrupt them. Yeah, totally, yeah. I mean... What he actually does is promote their natural inclination for self-corruption yeah. that we all have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, my gosh. And then these men come along with all these stupid pagan things. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, which oh. is just silly, actually. Yes, yes. Uh, it's just amazing. Yeah, it is. <laughs> in the majority of cases, these grave sites that the people began to visit in pilgrimages in the land of Israel, in the time of Rabbi Isaac Luria, were identified miraculously. There were very few graves that had gravestones with inscriptions that identified the person who was buried at the spot. And this is where Rabbi Isaac Luria became so famous and recognized as being saintly. He was considered to possess the spirit of Elijah and the spirits and the souls of other important men of the past. He's the new, possessed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the new Encyclopedia of Judaism, edited by Jacob Neusner and uh, Avery Pick and Green, has this to say about these miraculously identified graves, most of which were unmarked and no one could prove one way or another whether Luria was correct in his selections. The Encyclopedia states, uh, pages 679 and 680, quote, during the 16th century, many graves of Mishnaic and Talmudic rabbis were miraculously identified in Palestine and became the loci of individual and organized pilgrimage. Yeah. At the spread of Lurianic Kabbalah and the collections of the miraculous deeds of Luria himself, entitled The Praises of the Ari, local pilgrimage sites began to appear among many Jewish communities throughout the entire Muslim world, especially in North Africa. There, in North Africa, the native Berber popular religion, with graves of holy men, sacred trees, groves, brooks, pools, rocks, and grottos, had been thoroughly syncretized with local Islam. By the 20th century, in Morocco alone, there were no fewer than 652 shrines to Jewish saints. This is due to the common influences of the Lurianic Kabbalah in both its intellectual and popular manifestations. Even those Middle Eastern and North African rabbis who objected to the more exuberant and syncretistic practices of popular saint veneration tended to take a generally permissive attitude, due in part to the ubiquity of saint veneration and in part to a desire to keep pilgrimages and other practices associated with such venerations as much as possible within the halakhic or oral law bounds. Thus, for example, while the great Iraqi legal decisor Yosef Hayamim in 1833 or 1835 to 1909 ruled that the Jews of Arbil in Iraqi Kurdistan ought to abandon their custom of sacrificing cattle on the graves of Sadiqim in times of drought. The Sadiqim were dead righteous men of the past. He did not forbid prayer in those places. These are Jews doing this. Oh my gosh. Sacrificing cattle in Iraq over the graves of the righteous dead of the past. He did not forbid prayer at those places. 
This tolerant attitude continues today throughout much of the Sephardic world and in the state of Israel today, where saint veneration has undergone a major revival and is stronger than ever before. <clears throat> End quote, the Encyclopedia of Judaism. Yes, there is a widespread acceptance of these saint venerations even in modern Israel. It was Rabbi Saint Luria, it was, I'm sorry, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who commenced in earnest and popularized these pilgrimages to the graves of dead men who were thought to be righteous and still alive, often hovering around their graves. These dead men who were still thought to be alive were thought to have the powers of blessing and healing, and they could work miracles for those who relied on their spiritual help. Indeed, continue. the only thing that they didn't do, you know, was make little icons. Yeah. They had everything else, you know, like the Catholics and the Greek Orthodox, and, yeah. you know, they'd pray to these to images of these uh, saints. Uh. They did everything else, it seems. You know, it's amazing. These dead men who were thought to be alive were thought, like I said, indeed. Continuing on with the Encyclopedia of Jerusalem, quote, in the 1960s, synagogues named after Sadakim began to proliferate, and some of the sites became, uh, became the sites of major annual hillelot, or pilgrimage, around the same time, pilgrimages of graves of holy men, Buried in Israel began to attract increasing numbers of people. The Hillelot of Simon ben Yochai, the reputed originator of the Zohar, which taught the Kabbalah on Lag Ber Omer and Meron in Galilee, has become the most important pilgrimage among the Shephardim in Israel, attracting more than a hundred thousand a year. A great many new pilgrimage sites have emerged in Israel in recent decades, and newly recognized individuals are continually being added to the pantheon of Tzadikim. This is the Encyclopedia of Juda Juda Judaism, pages 688 to 690 and 699. These actions are pure and simple paganism in action, utterly condemned by the Torah and the, Tor and the Tanakh, the Holy Scriptures. The prime originator of these pilgrimages to the graves of righteous men is the same man who selected the who first selected the Wailing Wall as a divine spot for the Jews to assemble. This was Rabbi Jacob Luria. He was one of the most powerful men in 16th century Judaism with outstanding influence throughout all Judaism. His credentials center around the fact that he could identify persons in unmarked graves through visions, dreams, and supernatural revelations, not through the application of sound historical and geographical methods. Oh Indeed, Luria's prestige is still extremely high among many religious Jews. Those who accept him and his teachings are those Jews who have the religious mentality that governed the Jewish masses in the 16th century. Christians and Muslims have their share of such people as well. It is by such visionary and miraculously claimed identifications that so many places of pilgrimage have been selected to adore and at which the Jewish people should assemble and pray, supposedly. But what are, but are these places genuine? <clears throat> the real truth is that there has been much error, error that has infiltrated into the bosom of the three Abrahamic faiths. The Christians and Muslims of the past have done the same thing on a large scale. The ubiquity of the practice and its popularity even today shows how pervasive and insidious are such customs. These are all folk religious customs, pagan. If people believe them, as do thousands upon thousands of folk, they do immeasurable harm to the real facts of history, and they perpetuate dark age religious societal practices that have no basis in fact in demonstrating historical and geographical truths time is long overdue for a rectification of these absurd and mirac and ridiculous teachings and false identifications let's notice some of the false identifications 
geographically made by Rabbi Jacob Luria. This rabbi should not be looked on as a simple, deceived religious man. This is because of the supreme influence that the man and his teachings have had and still have in modern-day Judaism. Let's look at a few points. There was also a side to, Jake, to Rabbi Luria that many people have decided to ignore, but we need to be aware of it. The fact is, Luria also made some outstanding mistakes in his selection of former sites mentioned in the Holy Scriptures. We are told in Vilnay's Legends of the Jerusalem that Rabbi Luria supposedly knew in his day in a supernatural way where Jeremiah was placed in the court of the guard mentioned in Jeremiah 32, verse 2. Notice what Vilne records. It is told of Ha'ari, the holy, the head of the Safed Kabbalists in the 16th century, that he discovered the court of the guard and its pit into which Jeremiah was cast. Ha'ari then envisioned, and the mouth of the pit is narrow and its bottom large and round, about two L's in diameter, and there are places cut out of the mountain rock in which which were used as jails by the kings of Judah. <clears throat> and it is told that Jeremiah the prophet is buried in the court of the guard, unquote. Pages 242 to, to 3 in Vilnay's book. The only trouble was Rabbi Luria, that is Ha'ari, picked the spot now called Jer Jeremiah's Grotto in back of East Jerusalem's bus station. Luria selected the wrong place, a, a place that the Holy Scripture would in no way allow. Luria was about 3,000 feet north of the true site that was near the Gihon Spring. And it is clear in the biblical text that the prison in the house of the king of Judah was located south of, just south of the temple. Another, <clears throat> another geographical and historical error attributed to Rabbi Luria was his selection of the person who supposedly blocked up the Gihon Spring in earlier days, which had, in the previous century, been rediscovered in Jerusalem. According to Jewish historical sources, the Gihon Spring was again revealed and restored to the knowledge of the Jewish people by the, dis the, the disciple of Isaac Luria named Rabbi Chaim Vital. This great mystical leader of the Jews brought all Jerusalem within the embrace of the Lurianic Kabbalistic teaching in the 16th century. I will give the Jewish rendition of how the Gihon Spring was again restored to the knowledge of the Jews as shown in Zev Vilnay's Legend of Jerusalem, pages 276-277. Remember that the Jews of this time were prone to accept the teachings of some of the mystics as divine revelations direct from God. Quote, In the 16th century, Jerusalem was ruled by a tyrannical Turkish governor called Abu Saifan, father of the two swords. Knowing that a king of Judah had sealed up the fountain of Gihon, he asked whether there was, was one who could open it. His friends advised him, There is a wise Jew in this city, a man of God, and his name is Rabbi Chaim Vital. He will surely know how to open it. The governor sent for him on Friday, the Muslim day of rest, and said, I command you to open the fountain which was sealed by your king during the time that I am in prayer in the mosque. If you obey not, your blood will be on your head. Then a miracle occurred, and there appeared to Rabbi Vital in a vision his teacher, Ha-Ari, the holy, that is Rabbi Luria, the head of the mystics, who had been dead for several years, he said, the soul of King Sennacherib, the enemy of King Hezekiah, has been transmitted into the body of this governor, and in your body there is a spark of the soul of King Hezekiah. Peace be upon him. The Lurianic Kabbalistic teachings of, ha of Isaac Luria believed in the transmigration of souls, an Indian or Gentile doctrine never believed in by mainline Jews, before the revelation of the Kabbalah in the 13th century. The vision of Isaac Luria to Chaim Vital continues, And now is the time to open the fountain of Gihon, for it was without the consent of the sages that Hezekiah sealed its waters. And now, continued the vision of Rabbi Luria, 
If you are able to open the sealed Gihon, you will bring great blessing upon the people. Rabbi Vital answered, I shall open the fountain. This account vindicates the belief that Rabbi Vital accepted the instruction of Rabbi Luria that it was indeed King Hezekiah who blocked up the waters of the Gihon Spring. This belief was the first historical falsehood. As I've shown in my book, The Temples at Jerusalem Forgot, we have records from the Crusade period that it was actually Saladin, the Turkish Muslim ruler about 400 years before, who blocked up the Gihon. Yeah. But, and this is in uh, Gabrielli's Arab Historians of the Crusades, page 93, but the Jewish people in the 16th century believed that Rabbi Luria was, through the teaching of the transmigration of souls, a re-manifestation on earth of Adam, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and the Messiah, all combined in the person of Rabbi Luria. Oh, my goodness. With such credentials, uh, <laughs> Jews thought Rabbi Luria must have known the true sites of the, in Jerusalem and the long-lost unmarked graves of many earlier rabbis who lived in Galilee. But Jews they, are, you know, David, they're <clears throat> not stupid. No. You know? But they're just as gullible as you and I. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> as the Gentiles. Oh, you know, they're yeah. influenced by dreams. And when, you, when you're down and almost out, you'll accept anything oh, that my. gives you hope. Yeah. Oh, you know? Gee. They also believed he must have known it was Hezekiah who blocked up the Gihon rather than Saladin, as the historical records revealed. Saladin was the right person, not Hezekiah, as Luria stated in his visionary explanation. Some of Luria's identifications were gigantic errors. But why blame the Jewish people for believing such miraculous identifications when we equally have similar accounts of erroneous sites promulgated by our early Christian and Muslim authorities and still maintained by modern representatives of those re religious groups? There needs to be a thorough house cleaning of all this nonsensical and paganized forms of idolatry that now permeate the religious beliefs and customs and traditions of the Jews and of the Christians and of the Muslims. God help us and save us from such stupidities, Dr. Martin writes. Mm -hmm. Now, how was the Wailing Wall selected by Luria as a Jewish holy site? The ordinary Jewish people in the 16th century had no idea how anti-biblical Luria's teachings were or how wrong his geographical identifications were. They accepted his teachings altogether because he was to them a holy man of the first rank. And in his endeavor to select former unmarked graves of earlier rabbis of the past and also to show holy places long forgotten by the Jews, he had a hand in determining the Wailing Wall. That was at first a Christian Muslim holy site as being a holy, holy place for the Jews. Indeed, in my research, it appears that Luria was the first person in Jewish history 450 years ago to point out the present Wailing, Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, as of the, the place to assemble for the Jewish people where they ought to worship God. <clears throat> no Jewish person had ever gone to the Wailing Wall, as we call it today, until Luria told one Rabbi Abraham Halevi that he was worthy to see the Shekinah, or the Divine Presence. Oh, dear. <laughs> you know what's coming. <laughs> Vilne wrote about Luria Ha'ari and what he said to Rabbi Abraham Halevi. Note, it, note the comment by Vilne. Uh, quote, once the holy Ahari, or uh, Luria, said to Rabbi Abraham, know that your days are numbered and that you will soon die if you do not do as I tell you. But if you do, you will live another 22 years. This is what I bid you to do. Go to Jerusalem and pour out your prayers before the wailing wall, and you will prove yourself worthy by seeing the divine presence there. Rabbi Abraham went home shut himself in his house for three days and three nights, clothed himself in sackcloth and ashes, and fasted the whole time. He then went forth to Jerusalem. He stood before the wailing wall in prayer, deep meditation and weeping. The image of a woman clad in black uh, appeared 
unto him and on the face of the wall. Kind of like, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West in the, the yeah. opinion, you know, appears in the wall. Yeah. Uh, immediately he fell to the ground in great fear, tearing his hair. He cried in a long vo low, loud voice, Woe is me! What have I seen? Finally he fell into a deep slumber, and in a dream the Divine Presence appeared to him, clad in fine raiment, and said to him, Console yourself, my son Abraham. There is yet for you, and the children of Israel will return to their inheritance, and I will have mercy on them. He rose and returned to Safed, and when Luria the holy man saw him, he said unto him at once, Now I know that you have seen the Divine Presence, and you can rest assured that you will live another 22 years. End quote. Legends of Jerusalem, pages 165 to 166. As a result, Rabbi Abraham Halevi, who witnessed these things at the Wailing Wall, lived exactly 22 more years. The people considered this an astonishing confirmation of Rabbi Luria's divine powers and the truthfulness of his revelations for identifying geographical sites of former holy sites. From that time forward, Jews in Jerusalem began to flock to that former Jew Christian holy spot which the Muslims had cleaned up after they inherited it from the Christians, and the Jewish authorities soon turned it into what is now called the Wailing Wall. The fact is, the geography of the Wailing Wall fits the erroneous theological teachings of Luria to a T. Beyond that wall, eastward, was nothing. There were no buildings or shrines, and it supported and it provided support to his Kabbalistic teaching of the Ein Sof as being in exile and in a state of nothingness and that God's end would terminate in nothing. In other words, Luria's God for the Jewish people was a nothingness, a truly exiled and unknowable God. It's no wonder that Luria's God could not be seen. To Luria and those who followed him for the next 200 years, there was, quote, no discernible God, end quote in the final degree of non of his non-theistic understanding of the divine epiphany. Plainly, if a person reasoned the Lurianic philosophical beliefs to a proper conclusion, the person encounters no God. He finds only empty space. The empty space east of the Western Wall <coughs> was ideal in Luria's mind to emphasize the unsolved the nothingness of the deity. And the deity was not in his temple, but in exile, like the children of Israel. And to further demonstrate this, the account shows the Shekinah, first decorated as an old woman in black, in bl old woman in black mourning clothes, as a sign of its exile from, the, um, from its home. And when Rabbi Halevi was blessed with longer life, the Shekinah glory appeared in resplendent glory. To Luria, it was this wailing wall that best represented the spot to show the exilic condition of the Shekinah, and even Luria's tenth display of his divine epiphany called the Serifot, the Ein Sof, is also being in exile. Uh, from then on, Jews began to assemble at this part of the Haram as Sharif, in time, it became their most holy place in Jerusalem. It had nothing to do with the western wall of the Holy of Holies that earlier Jewish authorities had spoken about. As far as I can find, before the time of Luria, no Jewish person ever went to the present Wailing Wall to pray. Wow. <laughs> but Luria directed the Jewish people to the western wall. In doing so, he sent them to the wrong place. But Jewish people from that time were so impressed with Luria that they gave him a status equaled that, that equaled that of Moses or even greater. The Jewish authorities at, at his time absorbed his beliefs almost hook, line, and sinker. So, let's look at the perpetuation of the false or anti-biblical teachings of the Kabbalah and their in influence. Luria also established his own unique version of the Kabbalah. The teachings of this form of worship were almost 
thoroughly the myth of, in the mystical vein. Through his teaching of the transmigration of souls, he stated to his disciples that he inherited the soul of Adam, along with other souls who came into Luria's body to inhabit it by reincarnation. And by the way, it wasn't exclusively for Luria. It was also, you know, only a part of Adam or a part of Abraham or Moses or David went into Luria. Yeah. But they were also, you know, those portions are also available to other people. This is exactly as you described it, Georgia, and this is demon possession. Yes, it sure is. But the souls that entered Luria's body, those of Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, and even, and he even had the soul of the Messiah. Luria won over most of the influential rabbis of, at the time with his teachings, and for the next 200 years, mm -hmm. until the Jewish Enlightenment of the 1700s, Lurianic Kabbalah reigned most supreme in Jewish circles. And you can verify this by seeing the Encyclopedia Judaica article titled Judaism. Of course, most Jews do not believe in many of the weird teachings of J Rabbi Luria today. Many Jewish scholars and intellectuals have now learned to place such beliefs into a category of dark age mentality <coughs> that most religious groups have gone through at one time or another. And this is true enough, but it is the philosophy behind the concepts of Rabbi Luria that often continue to be believed by many religious Jews. There is still among religious Jews and many Christians and Muslim believers in what we call Dark Age doctrines of the Middle Age mentality. Yeah. At any rate, I have shown with an abundance of historical and biblical evidences that the original temples of God were positioned over and around the Gihon Spring in the southeastern part of Jerusalem. The evidence is so strong that one wonders how such <clears throat> an obvious fact could be so hidden from the attention of the world so long. Perhaps we all ought to read the whole of Isaiah chapter 29 once again. Yeah. The answer why the sites of the temples have been hidden is no doubt found in that chapter 29 of Isaiah. In conclusion, the acceptance of the present wailing wall by the Jewish authorities as a wall of Herod's temple was inspired by false visions and false dreams and by so-called false miraculous events. And lying spirits. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That turned a former Christian holy site, which was bogus in itself, yeah. into the prime Jewish spot for divine veneration. Oh. That spot was not discovered by using historical and biblical facts. The present Wailing Wall is a modern invention devised about 350 years ago and Jewish scholars know this to be a certain fact. That Wailing Wall is actually the western wall of Fort Antonia. Yes. But they don't acknowledge that. The true temple was located over the Gihon Spring on the southeast ridge of Jerusalem. There can be no doubt of this fact. It is time for all people to abandon these false religious sites. You know, Georgiana, it occurred to me <laughs> while I was reading this that if Luria would he would have been well served to discover the tomb of King David. Yeah. <laughs> which has a historical basis. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Which has a relationship to the true temple. But it's interesting that the spirits led him away from that. Isn't that a very good point, David? You're right. <laughs> Not only of the temple, but of the site of King David's tomb. Right. Now, you know, the, the site of the temple uh, is just, I don't know, it just boggles the mind of, of how they lost it, and yet they did. Um, and this Jacob Luria is a direct uh, ancestor of the people that uh, Barry Chalmers talks about. Oh, yeah. With yeah. Sabbatai Levy. Yes. Absolutely. It's the same mystical tradition. <laughs> the same, at the end, there is no God, which allows for the mysticism of, you know, the inner circle of groups, of yeah. which there are probably many, not just yeah. one major group or conspiracy, to believe.
believe the silly things that they believe because at the base there's nothing there. And that all of this mysticism is just the power of the mind that we, you know, it's all about man. It's all about them. Yes. It's all about, and that there is no God at the base of it, that we are God ourselves. Oh, now, yeah. New God, and, and, and it's been recycled and repackaged in all this New Age stuff. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it seems like every 200 years. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It, it just recycles and repackages, and that's a good phrase. But you know, that is an excellent point that you made, that uh, these spirits led him away from the true sight. Well, the same thing was done during the time of Constantine when his uh, mother and his wife, I think it was his wife, quote, discovered, end quote, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, which became the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, and, uh, but, and she brought back pieces of the cross and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this was all because of dreams and visions also. Yeah. And Constantine himself, Eusebius says, had thousands of dreams and visions during his lifetime, which, of course, if he gets a, as a direct line to God, uh, you know, the scriptures are interesting but secondary. I mean, if you have a direct line, uh, what do you need? What do you need letters for? Yeah. When you've got the phone line, you can just pick up the phone, and God communicates with you directly. Well, I don't know of anybody that's having that privilege. So. No, no. <laughs> you know, but David, this is this information is so so important. It's involved, but yeah. You know, and yeah. I hope that people will listen to this and go back. Again, with a notebook and a pen and paper and take notes. Yeah. I, I mean it. This is, it, it's, <laughs> wow. It, it answers a lot of questions. You know? Yeah, yeah, it does. And it's interesting that everybody over there is fighting over the wrong stuff. Yeah. yeah. The Christians, the Jews, the Muslims. Yeah. I mean, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is not where Christ was crucified or you know, yeah. resurrected. Right. The Wailing Wall is not the Wailing Wall. The yeah. temple was not uh, there. You know, uh, the the Muslims took a piece from the Gihon Springs, yeah. transferred it onto the Haram, uh -huh. and through a, a concept called transfer of holiness, yeah. th that suddenly became, in their mind, the equivalent of the temple. And it's no more the equivalent the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque are no more the, where God's presence is than, you know, a, a Mormon temple is the temple of God. It just ain't the, it just it ain't true. Amen to that. You're right. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness, David. Thank you, and God bless you for all this work. Um, I know. People all over the world listen to these audio files, and uh, uh, you know, time is short, and we've got to get as much of the truth out there as we can. And uh, I really appreciate, and I know the listeners do too, you taking the time to do all this because it, you know, I mean, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. So imagine the work that Dr. Martin did. Oh all my this together. goodness! Yes, <laughs> God bless that man. It seems almost like a bottomless resource, and yet yeah, it's not. But it just seems that way sometimes. And then when you go back later, years later, because there's so much mat excellent material. Yes, and you know you you come back to it and informed by all the other information. It's like coming back to this material again for the first time. I yeah. haven't read this article for quite a while. Oh. And, uh, you know, this it's amazing. I Well, we have to close, but it's, it's just uh, remarkable how much information there is. Good stuff. Good information will drive out bad, and I think yes. that's beginning to happen. I I agree with you. I really do. And there, the big shakeout is getting more more and more is being shaken <laughs> yep 
Oh, my goodness, everybody. Go check out askelm.com. It's a treasure trove of information. Um, you can communicate with David Seeloff at this address. It's david at askelm.com. And uh, this closes the strange story of the false wailing wall. Wow, what a story. My goodness. Well, God bless you all out there that are listening. And uh, pay attention. And God bless you, David. Good night, everybody.